Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. John Hill Church. I'm Dave Butler. I'm the pastor here. If you're visiting with us this morning, uh, we wish you a special welcome. Glad that you can be with us as well. Uh, today is a very special Sunday. First, it is Pentecost Sunday, uh, which is the day we celebrate uh, the Holy Spirit coming in force uh, to the Church of Christ and giving its life and sending it on its mission. And uh, secondly, we're happy today that we will be uh, baptizing uh, two of the covenant children in the Brendel family, and we look forward to doing that after the service this morning. That's always a great uh, celebration of the church. And as such, um, we won't be having our uh, children's Sunday school program this morning during the sermon because we want everybody to be able to be here and to be a part of that celebration. So we'll be moving that to next Sunday instead. Are there other announcements? We need to uh, die way to that piece. starting in June. It'll be rolling into town. The theme this year is Rocky Railway. We'll be <laughs> um, it'll be held a little differently this year. Um, we're going to be holding it on a weekend from Friday to Sunday. It'll be Friday night, June 11th from 6 to 7.30 and Saturday and Sunday the 12th and 13th from 2 to 4. So registration is available on the website, on the church website. So we're looking for more participants and a few more volunteers. Um, the donation board is up in the narthex. Um, we're looking for donations for BBS and then also we're going to be doing like a mission project with the kids and um, it's through multi-service and we're going to be supplying um, Back, back to school items for hopefully 50 kids. Um, so there are donations that can be made and they're listed on the board back there also. So if you take a, a slip of paper to um, take a donation, please write your name on the list back there next to the number item that you took so that we know who, who has everything. So um, if you have any questions, you can get with me or with Nikki, and uh, we'd be happy to help. And like I said, we'll roll it in soon. Thank you. Any other announcements before we begin this morning? All right, with that, let's uh, prepare our hearts for worship as we go to
calls us to worship. Hear these words from Psalm 27, a Psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be content. One thing have I asked of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have arisen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Would you pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today to praise the name of Jesus Christ because you are our rock and our redeemer. O oh Lord, we wait for you in great expectation because of the great promises that you have made. We wait for the fulfillment of the coming of, again of Jesus Christ. And Father, while we wait, we wait knowing that we can proclaim, proclaim the gospel of Jesus to a world that so desperately needs it. Father, would you be pleased with our worship this morning, that all we say would be good and pleasing to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we will hear from our choir.
We have a milk, we do it as part of our tradition. Um, but in a lot of places, they have more of a Baptist understanding of you know, what we would call believer's baptism, that we wait for people to make a confession of faith uh, and then baptize them, where we will baptize the children of uh, believing parents uh, before they can make a profession of faith. And some people don't uh, often understand why that is. So it's my goal this morning to explain why we do what we do. And interestingly enough, the answer to that question begins in Genesis chapter 17. So when she said, well, can we do it on the 23rd? And I was looking through my schedule ahead and I knew that this is where we were going to be. And I said, that would be perfect. Because Genesis 17 begins to answer that question for us. Um, so let's hear the word of God this morning. And normally when I do this, it takes me about an hour to get through everything. I'm going to try to go fast and condense it this morning. So if you feel like, man, he just you know, plowed through that, that's why. Because uh, normally I do this with a whiteboard and I'm writing things and drawing lines and make it to help it be clear. So if you don't catch it the first time, I'll be happy to do it again some other time when we can uh, make sure that we've got everything uh, in order. And I also understand that this is something it took me personally a long time to get to a position on infant baptism. So I want to say, if you're not there, right, if, if you're like, no, I'm, I'm not sure about this, I don't think this is biblical, be rest assured, there's a lot of faithful Christians who would agree with you. Okay? And that's okay. You can disagree with me on this, and, and we're still friends. All right? Um, we'll work on it together and, and try to come uh to a biblical understanding. But I just want you to know, if, if you look at me and say, Pastor, I think you're wrong on this. We're okay. All right. Um, I think I'm right, but you know, this is the best that I've come up to now. But I didn't always land here. It took me a long time to get here. So if you're not there yet, I understand. And we'll have patience with each other and extend uh, some grace in that respect. Let's hear the word of God this morning from Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money, from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people, he has broken my covenant. 
And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day, as God had said to him. Abraham was ninety-nine years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. And all the men of his house, those born in the house, and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, we come before your word this morning, longing to hear from you. Father, would you be our teacher this morning by your spirit? Help us, O oh Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a lot of stuff in here. So, I want to think about where we've been. Okay? And I want you to kind of think about it in terms of marriage. And those of you who've been married, you've probably gone through something like this. Now, when the idea of marriage pops in your head, I mean, you know, when Rose and I, when I first met Rose, we were uh, freshmen in college, uh, met her first semester, in the dining hall at Messiah College. She came up, I was talking to uh, one of my roommates, I, uh, I was in a Quad, so there were four of us in one room, and I was talking to one of my roommates, and, and she kind of liked him. And so she came up to talk to him, and he introduced her to me. And we just we exchanged pleasantries, and she uh, went on her happy way. And I immediately thought to myself, I could marry her. <laughs> now, because I had that thought, we weren't married. In fact, it took me another three years before she would agree to go on a date with me. She said no for three years. But eventually, patience wore out. And I went and I, I purchased a ring and I proposed marriage to her and I gave her a ring. That proposal didn't mean that we were married. Okay? It meant that we were engaged. And then, you know, we set a date, and I didn't wait too long. You know, we, you know, I bought the ring in February. I proposed in March. We were married in August. I said, you know, I'm not going to give her any time to change her mind. And so in August, you know, when we get married, and it'll be... If you're interested, it'll be 25 years this August, so I haven't let her go yet. I know when you get a good thing, you hold on to it. When we got married in August, we made promises to each other, and we gave each other rings. Still wearing the same one. 
And that ring is a sign to us and to everyone else that we are married. It's a, the, the ring itself is not the marriage, but it's a sign that says we're married to each other. It's a sign of the covenant. It's a sign of the promises that we make to each other. Okay? So now, if you've, been, if you've been with us, you've noticed that this idea of a covenant between God and Abram, now Abraham, keeps popping up. Popped up in chapter 12, it popped up again in chapter 15, and now here it is again in chapter 17. So, it hasn't changed. Nothing about the idea of the covenant has changed. But the process that God went through is kind of like getting to know you, getting engaged, making the promises, and showing the sign once the covenant is confirmed. And so God made the promise, you know, he called Abram together, you know, it's when we started going on dating, you know, we're calling each other, you know, ourselves to each other. I think that's kind of like chapter 12. In 15, God makes the promise. And notice God, remember, God made the promise that he would take all the responsibility of the covenant on himself. Now, that's different than the promises that she and I made. Okay? Our promises are together and to each other, but God made the promise all himself. He, the smoking pot and the, the flaming torch, walked between the pieces of the, of the animals alone. God took all the responsibilities there. And now the sign of the covenant agreement is coming to Abram. What is the outward sign, like the wedding ring that Rose and I wear, what is the outward sign and the outward sign of the covenant to show the inclusion that we are included in the covenant, we wear these rings, for Abraham to, to understand the covenant and to show the outward sign of the covenant is that he would to be he was to be circumcised in his foreskin. Now you think that's kind of a weird sign. You might think that's really kind of gross. And you would be right. Why would God choose such a weird sign? to indicate his covenant agreement with his people. Well, let me ask you this. If somebody offends you greatly, they lie to you and steal from you, whatever, greatly, what do you do to them? If you're honest, most people would say, I cut them off. I cut them out of my life. They're cut off from me. I don't associate with them. Sin was so great a problem, going back to Genesis 3, and if you're keeping track, I generally reference Genesis 3 in every sermon. Genesis 3, what happens? The man and the woman sin against God. And they're cast out, they're cut off from the presence of God in the garden. They've been cut off from the presence of God, they, they no longer have that fellowship, that direct fellowship with God. And God places a cherubim, an angel, with a flashing sword at the, guard, the entrance of the garden to guard the tree of life. And so God chooses this intimate, bloody sign of his covenant with his people, saying, here was the problem. You have been cut off from me. And I'm working on an agreement that's going to bring us back together. And the promise of the sign, the fulfillment of that sign comes from Jesus who is the true living offspring of Abraham. The promised one, all the way back in Genesis 3, 15 and 16, the one who would come to crush the serpent's head, that 
the fulfillment of that sign comes from Jesus. In the form of Jesus. In the death of Jesus on the cross. Where Jesus himself is cut off from the Father. He's forsaken by the Father for you and me. Do you see the connection? It's a weird sign. Why would God choose circumcision to be the sign of his people? It's a physical and tangible reminder that we have been cut off from God's presence. But through Jesus, who he himself was cut off from God for us, takes the punishment for our sin on himself for us, he is the fulfillment of that circumcision. So for Abraham, and did you notice how many times God said, to you and to your offspring, to you and to your offspring, we saw back in Genesis 15 that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now catch that. Abraham had faith in God before he received the sign of inclusion in God's covenant. Abraham had faith prior to receiving the sign. Okay? Now, you know what a sign is, right? So always remember, you know, think about what a sign is. When you drove in here today, there's a good chance that you passed one of the directional where to signs. I think, Daddy, was it Drew that made those? With, yeah, the, the, the Daddy son Drew made signs that have the name of our church, our logo on it, pointing in a specific direction to tell you how to get here. Right? Everybody see one of those signs probably when you drove in? If you didn't see one, look for them. You know, Drew made some good signs. They're, they're great. Those signs are pointing to this church, which would be this building and all of you. Okay? The church is not just the building, but it's the people associated, you know, that gather here. The signs are not the church. Right? The signs point to the church. The sign points to something bigger than the sign. Circumcision is a sign that's pointing to something. That's what signs do. They point to something. It's pointing to an agreement. Our rings, our wedding rings, are not our marriage. But they're a sign that we gave to each other that says, I am yours and you are mine. God's sign of circumcision that he gives to Abraham says, I am yours and you are mine. I will be your God and you will be my people. And Abraham had faith prior to receiving the sign. But now here's the tricky part. Abraham is commanded not just to take the sign for himself, but that every male in his household also gets the sign. Do you think every male in his household also had the same faith that Abraham had? Maybe. Probably not. But they still got the sign. Why did they get the sign? Because Abraham had faith, and they were included in the covenant under Abraham. Does that mean that they had saving faith? No. You can have the sign, but not have the thing that the sign signifies. I can have a wedding ring. And I can also be out dating and flirting and having relationships with other women, which would be a violation of my covenant, of my marriage covenant to my wife. I still have a ring, but I'm not acting faithfully in the covenant. 
You can have the sign without having what it signifies. So the key, the true key to inclusion in the covenant that Abraham had before he got the sign was that he accepted the covenant terms with God, that God, you know, God would be God and Abraham would be his people. He accepted those terms from the heart. And he says to God, Abraham says, what I should do and what I want to do are not the same thing. God, the things that I should do according to your word and the things that I want to do are not the same thing. Think about it in terms of a marriage. In a good, healthy, godly marriage, a husband and a wife should want, you know, they should work to the benefit of each other. That's what God calls us to do. Each for the other. And if we're both 100% in on each for the other, and that is what we want to do. Not, that's what i got to do. Because God says, I've got to be faithful to my wife. I've got to love my wife. I've got to lay down my wife. Because Christ will be faithful to me. If that's our attitude, we're not doing it right. But for me, I see the beauty of my wife. And I want to be faithful to her. I want to fulfill my, my end of the covenant agreement. And I hope she feels the same way for me, because that's what's going to make our marriage work and be strong and be a godly marriage. Being part of God's covenant family says, I've seen the beauty of God, I've seen the beauty of Jesus, and I want to fulfill my part of God's covenant, that he will be my God and I will be his people. And when my desires match what I ought to do, that I am fulfilling the covenant from the heart. So under the Old Covenant, and the Old Testament, Testament's just another word for covenant, under the Old Covenant, the sign of entry into the covenant is circumcision. For males. Okay? That's the sign of entry. Now what we're going to find that when we get to the Exodus story, the sign of the covenant renewal, of covenant remembrance, is going to be the Passover meal. That they're required to observe every Passover. And when they partake of that meal, it's a remembrance of God's covenant, of his salvation, of his redemption for his people. When they participate in that meal, they are renewing, remembering their covenant vows. The same way when you probably do it too, every year when we have an anniversary of our wedding, and we usually have some kind of celebration and we remember our covenant vows to each other. And we usually, you know, we usually go out to eat and we talk about, you know, you know, the great things that have happened, the trying things that have been, but we, we kind of reaffirm that covenant with each other. And so they, every time they would observe the Passover meal, they would be, in a sense, renewing their covenant vows with God. That's how things work under the old covenant. When Jesus comes, he institutes a new covenant. So the question we have to ask is, well, what's new about the new covenant? Well, the writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus comes to institute a new and better covenant. And as we said before, Jesus becomes the embodiment of the sign of circumcision when he is on the cross and he is cut off for our sake from God. 
But what becomes the sign that Jesus gives that we are united with him in his death and resurrection? Baptism. We see this in Colossians chapter Chapter 2, verse 9 says, For in him, in Christ, the fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. And verse 11, In him, in Christ, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. So in him, you also were circumcised by the circumcision of Christ. Well, what's the circumcision of Christ? The circumcision of Christ is his death on the cross. All right? So we are, in a sense, circumcised in Christ through his death and resurrection. It says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So Paul makes this connection between the baptism, the circumcision of Christ, his death on the cross, and the sign that, that brings us into that covenant is baptism. Which is why what we're used to when someone comes to Christ, generally an adult believer, they come, they profess faith in Christ, and they you know, want to embrace God's covenant from the heart, the first thing that we know that we're commanded to do is to baptize them. But Acts tells us in, in many of the places where that happened to the first generation believers that not only was the person baptized, but their whole household was baptized. That would have been a natural thing because under the old covenant, the sign of the covenant didn't just go to the, you know, the father of the house, but it went to every male in his household was covered under that same covenant agreement. So we baptize our children as a part of understanding because they are children of believers, they too share in the promise of God's covenant. Does that mean that they are saved? Does that mean they have accepted the covenant and embraced it from the heart? No. You can have the sign without having the thing signified. We'll see when Isaac is born, right? when Isaac is eight days old, he's going to be circumcised. Anybody ever met an eight-day-old eight baby who was with it enough to say, yes, I believe in God? No, Isaac was given the sign before he had the faith required for it. So we baptize children before they can express the faith required because we believe in the promises of God. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, Peter gives up and gives this great speech to the people in Jerusalem. And he gives this great sermon, and when he's done, the, the, the people are so cut to the heart, he says, they, they say to Peter, what should we do? And Peter says to them, repent and be baptized. He said, this promise is for you and for your children. The promise is for you and for your children. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 
that the child of even one believing parent, doesn't have to be both, just one believing parent is considered holy in the eyes of God. We baptize children because we believe in God's promises extend to the family. Part of the problem is in America, we like to think of ourselves as rugged individuals. God does not tend to think in individual terms. He generally tends to think in terms of families because that's what he instituted in the garden. That Adam and Eve were not just two rugged individuals, but they were to be a family unit operating together. Each for the other. And so when God enters into covenant relationship with us, it's, John, it's not just about me being saved. It's about me being incorporated into the covenant family of God. So your salvation is not about you. Never has been. It's about us. The goal of your salvation is not for you to go to heaven. The goal of your salvation is for you to be part of the covenant people of God. This is why every Sunday we have a corporate prayer of confession. Because we are a body of believers. And at times, we as a corporate body of believers, we mess up. We sin. That corporate prayer of confession is not about you, it's about us. The silent part after that, that's about you. But the corporate part says, God, we are a family, we are your people, and we together have sinned. And we have to own that. And we have to repent and seek forgiveness of that as a corporate body. We also have to deal with ourselves individually. But it's not a one or the other. It's a both and. In America, that's hard for us. Because, again, we like to think of ourselves as just, you know, these rugged individuals who pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we get things done on our own. In the church, it's not that way. We are here together. Now, this is important to understand because when we baptize these two beautiful children this morning, I'm not baptizing them for their own sake. I'm baptizing them into the body and family of Christ. So I'm going to ask questions to the parents. And when I'm done with that, I'm going to ask a question of you. Because you, as the congregation of this church, have a responsibility to every covenant child in this church. Because we are the corporate body of Christ. We are not baptizing them into just general Christianity. We are baptizing them into the body which for us is all of us here and we all have responsibility for each other. If you want to be Baptist now and say amen, it's, it's a good time. But you know, I understand the, the German reform folks tend to be a little stiff and, and quiet. But, you know, it's okay. You don't, you don't get punished for but thank God that's true. We need each other. Because until Jesus comes, we are at a war with evil powers that want to see this place divided. And if we are not united as the body of Christ, if we're out here on these separate little islands doing our own little thing. Anybody who's studied war knows it's easy to pick off people who aren't together. 
when I used to work in, in Harrisburg, working on the 14th floor of Strawberry Square downtown. In the building next to us, outside my window, uh, behind us in that building, there was nesting a peregrine falcon. And every day around this time, I would turn around and look out the window, and there'd be pigeons and doves and things flying in a circle. And then all of a sudden, you would see this bird of prey coming through. And that bird of prey was always looking for the straggler who wasn't with the group. The birds knew to fly in a tight circle in the group because there was protection in the group. If you got outside of that, you were an easy meal for the predator. The Bible tells us that Satan is like a roaring lion pacing around looking for whom he may devour. It's a lot easier to defend against an attack of a lion if there's multiple people defending each other. Going one on one with a lion, good luck. You're probably not going to fear yourself. We need each other. That's the way God designed it for our benefit that we are covenant people serving God but in covenant community with each other. We need each other. So when you baptize these lovely girls, we are baptizing them into this family. And we, I'm going to ask you, are you going to take responsibility for the upbringing of these children? As, to aid their parents in bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And you better be saying, we do. Or I'm going to get up here and preach this again until we get it. Because that's our job. That's what it means to be part of the covenant people of God. Is that we look after each other. We are, when we are baptized, we're not just baptized into an a, a individualistic religion. We are baptized into a family. That's why we baptize our babies because we believe that God's promises can extend to even those who do not yet have faith. We pray for them to come to faith. We want to see God's promises of faith to come to them. And we claim that on their behalf. Even before they have it. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of Believing what God has promised. I hope. Now I know that I did that quickly and I try to run through normally I'm drawing lines and you know have a whiteboard and get, can do all this a little better. And I know I went through that quickly. If you have questions, I'll be happy to slow this down and talk with you some more if I you know, you didn't catch any of that. But I hope I kind of made that clear to at least that you understand the rationalization biblically why we do this. There are other Christians in the world, faithful, loving, you know, godly people who don't see it this way. And, you know, so this is an argument in the family. Here's the thing. We both can't be right. And we both can't be wrong. One of us is right, one of us is wrong. Which means we need to have grace with the other as we try to, to work and to figure this out. It's an important question. I think we have it right. But I would also reserve the right to be wrong. Because there's a lot of smart people on the other side who don't see it this way. It took me a long time to see it. I can't unsee it. Now, but this is why we bring children forward in the celebration of baptism, because we believe that God's promises extend not just to individuals, but to families. In response 
to God's word. Would you join me as we um, affirm our faith together before we uh, bring the Brendel family forward? Uh, let us affirm our faith in, by reciting the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So before I invite the Randall family to come forward, uh, let me first again just clarify our views regarding baptism, especially the baptism of children. As a church, we believe that baptism in the name of the Trinity in water is very important because it was commanded by our Lord Jesus to symbolize our spiritual union, our inclusion in the covenant with him. Yet someone can still be saved without ever being baptized. God's grace is in no way limited. And just because someone has been baptized, either as an infant, a child, or as, as an adult, it does not guarantee salvation. Question 45 in the New City Catechism asks the question, is baptism with water the washing away of sin itself? And the answer is no, only the blood of Christ and the renewal of the Holy Spirit can cleanse us from sin. But with that said, I will invite uh, the Brendel family to come and uh, join us this morning as we um, baptize their children.
yet as signified and pledged in baptism. May the Holy Spirit work through the promises of this sacrament in planting and nurturing faith in the hearts of these dear little ones. Please protect these children from evil, from the schemes of the devil. We entrust these children to the care of the great shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. What is the name of Jesus? Ellie Grace Brendel. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And what is the name of this child? Emma Hope Brendel. I baptize you in the name of the Father. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, I would ask the congregation to please stand. We talked about this earlier, so you should know the right answer. Do you, the people of the Lord, promise to receive these children in love, pray for them, help instruct them in the faith, and encourage and sustain them in the fellowship of the believers? If so, please say, we do. We do. Brothers and sisters, we now receive these children in Christ's church, and I charge you to nurture and love them, to assist them to be Christ's faithful disciples. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that insofar as these children did not choose their parents, neither did we first choose you. And so we take this occasion to thank you for the physical breath with which you bless us and the spiritual breath by which we were graciously and mercifully born again. Lord, we ask that you would please impart to these precious ones in whom you have already bestowed physical life spiritual life, and that we pray for this end, your grace would rest mightily and mercifully upon their parents. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. All right. So we have for you guys my favorite life. You may be seated. Thank you for the beauty that is around us in nature. 
Lord, we thank you for uh, the grace that you give to us through Jesus. And Lord, we come before you this morning knowing that there are still many concerns in the hearts of your people. And Lord, as a family, we, we lift those up to you now, Lord, even those that were not spoken. But Father, we know that you know our hearts and minds. And so, Lord, by your spirit, would you help us to release those cares to you today? That your grace and mercy, that your love and tenderness would address each of those. Father, would you give peace and healing according to your will? Father, we give you thanks again for the great covenant promises that you bestow upon us. Help us, Lord, to live as your people, not just as individual Christians, but as members of your covenant family. Bless us with your spirit in this, O Lord, we pray in Jesus' name who taught his disciples and so us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In response to God's word, would you stand as we sing our closing hymn, Love Lifted Me?
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forever. Amen.